Good evening, members, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, especially with the last minute date change. We really appreciate it. So um, thank you very much for joining us. It's myself, Anna Spooner, this evening from the tastings team. Just seen somebody saying from a sunny Hertfordshire. Couldn't agree more. It's absolutely beautiful this evening. So uh, yes, I'm joining you from a sunny Essex. So you've got me, Anna Spooner, and we've got Mahesh behind the scenes again tonight. Thank you again, Mahesh, for, for changing your plans too. Mahesh has got to run off at 7.45 this evening, but not to worry. I will hang around for a bit to uh, answer some questions, as we usually do with our focus on sessions. <coughs> Pardon me. So we'll do as we usually do. Um, we'll have some slides. I'm going to get a little bit technical. I'll talk about that in a moment. But please use the chat to let us know where you are and what you're drinking. I know that lots of you are going to be catching up on YouTube, so you won't be able to use or see that chat. Uh, but those of you here tonight, please do feel free to use it. We'd like to know where you are and what you're drinking especially if you've bought any of the wines that I'm going to taste this evening as well. We love to hear your thoughts on those as you taste along with us. And then, of course, the Q&A. We have the Q&A box. You can use that to pop your questions in and then Mahesh behind the scenes will deal with those. Uh, he always asks me as well, and I always forget right until the last minute. If you are using the chat tonight, please remember to hit everyone. Uh, so far, so good. Everyone's doing it correctly, but don't hit hosts and panelists when you're addressing your message. That is the default, but it means that only Mahesh and I will see it. And uh, it would be a shame not to not to have your fellow members see your message. So I think without further ado, we can kick on with this evening's session and discuss how wines age. Um, it's a bit of a how and a why the, this evening's webinar. Um, we are gonna explain the science behind aging um, but the science is always changing, or at least the science isn't, but our understanding of the science isn't. So the information I'm going to give you tonight is the most up-to-date information. However, it could change. It could change tomorrow with a new piece of research. research pardon me. It could change in 10 years. Uh, one example I'll talk about later is our understanding of how tannins develop with age. Um, it's It's been blown out of the water. Things I've been talking about and teaching for years are now proven not true. Well, when we get to tannins, we'll talk about that. But um, why is it so complex? Well, <clears throat> there's a huge amount of stuff going on in wine. So there's lots of chemicals. Uh, there's lots of things that are inherent in the grape. And remember, there's different grape varieties. So not only do they have different compounds, they've got different levels. Um, and then of course, winemaking techniques. Wines are made in completely different ways. So there is no sort of carte blanche, one size fits all answer. And because of that, it just means we have so much variation and it's really, really hard to study. And then of course we have different vintages, different aging periods, the list goes on. But what we do know is that certain styles of wine do age well. Um, and we know that certain styles of wine don't age well. There are always surprises along the way. And our first wine is, a wine that perhaps breaks some of the rules, uh, which I love, and that's why I wanted to show it to you. So take the rules with a pinch of salt, but rest assured most wines, following some of the information I'm gonna give you this evening, fit into those general rules. Um, now, I'm just gonna get my screen up actually, if that's all right, members, um, because yeah, uh, there are four areas I'm going to cover. They sound very basic, but we're going to deep dive into some of them. Uh, so we're going to cover acidity, we're going to cover why it's important in aging wines and what happens to it when you age wines. Flavours and aromas, same again, why are they important and what happens to them. I'm going to tell you a few bits about um, chemical processes that we know of. And I'm going to use a huge caveat there, that we know of. Um, and just highlight some top ones. Then we'll taste the white wine. And then we're gonna talk about color. You don't need color to age wines, but it does change considerably. And I'm gonna explain the chemical process in that because that's something we think we understand better. Then we'll taste our sad stuff. Then we'll go on to tannins, uh, perhaps the most controversial point. Um, we sort of need them to age wine, but uh, they do seriously also change in the aging process. And the science jewelry is out. So that's going to be our most controversial topic. Um, we'll taste the Gamay uh, after that. And we're not going to cover sugar today. Wine aging can be assisted by sugar, 
to some degree, but we don't have time to cover it tonight. So we're going to cover it in a later session because sweet wines almost have laws unto themselves. So let's kick off with acidity. So acidity in both whites and red wines does give some support for aging. Now, that's not to say that all high acid wines age well, because there's so many that don't. Um, you know, I can take a really early pick, relatively high acid Pinot Grigio. You should not be aging that wine. OK, but there are good things about the combination of high levels of acid and so a high concentration of the actual acid itself and a low pH. And those two things combined bring stability in the wine. Now, why is that important for aging? Well, a stable wine means it's less likely to get contaminated. Uh, you're less likely to have microbial problems. So generally, it sounds very boring, but it does mean that it gives the wine this, this permission, this structure, this possibility to age. Um, yes, you can add sulfur. It's harder on high pH wines. You have to add way more sulfur and pH levels sound like they don't vary very much in wine because it's usually between sort of three and four. Um, but my goodness, it makes such, such a difference. But what is actually happening to the wine during um, the aging process? This is also really interesting. And tartaric acid, which is the main acid we talk about in grapes. So you have tartaric and you have malic. Um, and it go undergoes this process called esterification. And esterification is a process, and I, I do not pretend to be a chemist. I always say I'm not a chemist on focus on sessions, but it loses something called a carboxyl group. And effectively, what you really need to know, unless you want to do a chemistry degree, is that actually through during the aging process, so with time and undergoing this process of esterification, the wine actually ends up tasting less sour. So that is actually a chemical thing that's happening. It's not your mind playing tricks on you. Wines that age, the tartaric acid changes. It loses part of it, part of its um, compound and it ends up tasting less sour. So this same acid, tartaric acid, can also transform. And I actually spoke about this with somebody yesterday. It's strange how thing, these things happen. I haven't spoken about it in months. Um, it has an L form and a mirror D form. And again, we don't need to talk too much about what that means. And I would, I'm sure there's more qualified people to talk about the chemistry on that, um, on this call. But effectively what happens is tartaric acid moves from this D form, uh, sorry, L form to D form, and the D form is less soluble in water. So the other thing that happens is that it drops out as tartaric crystals. And I don't know whether any of you have seen tartaric crystals before, but they are, um, I didn't get any on the bottles today. I really wanted to show you, but you often get them on the cork and they look um, like little pieces of salt, sea salt, or you get them as what my colleague Emma affectionately calls glass diamonds or diamonds in the glass. And they sit at the bottom of the glass, usually at the end of the glass, completely harmless. It is tartaric acid that has, um, it's essentially a sediment, you could say. You spot it more easily in white wine because you're not expecting it, but it's in both colours. Um, and it's essentially a crystal formed of the tartaric acid, literally dropping out because it's not, it's less soluble in its D form. And that happens with time. Um, so that's acid. So we've covered acid. Well done. We're going to jump into flavors and aromas. And I'm going to give you a word of warning. This is intense. And, and before you say you've missed a box, I haven't. Um, but this is quite intense, the flavors and aromas section. So... If you do have wine one, it's the sort of slide where you might need a glass of wine, right? So feel free to get started. And we're gonna talk about wine one straight after we talk about what happens to flavors and aromas in wine. So do feel free to taste along. I won't, I'll keep talking and then I'll taste with you afterwards. Um, but flavors and aromas, <laughs> well, the easiest thing I can do is, is here I can say to you the name of the compounds, um, what they taste like or don't taste like as the case may be, what happens during the aging process and then what they end up being. And I've seen it written out in all sorts of forms and in textbooks it's in all sorts of ways, but I thought this sort of graph would help just to, to, we can go line by line because it's quite fun to spot these things and you can tell 
shall we say, which wines um, you might be talking about. I was going to do like a quiz, but I've decided I'm just going to tell you which sort of grapes we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> it's worth saying that generally, there's a rule break coming up, but generally higher concentrations of flavours and aromas tend to make wines more suitable for ageing. So if you've got a wine that doesn't taste like very much, you shouldn't age it because of all the things I'm about to tell you. There is an exception to that rule and we are going to taste it this evening. So um, generally, higher levels of flavours and aromas, good for ageing amongst the other things in the mix. But what is happening to those flavours and aromas? First things first, these are all technically um, aromas and flavours you find in the grape or their chemical compounds within a grape. They're not necessarily, um, well, first of all, they're not from processes. So they're not from malolactic fermentation. They're not from barrel flavors. They are, I guess, from the process of fermentation and crushing the grapes. A lot of these flavors, if let's take terpenes at the top, for example, terpenes are naturally occurring in grapes, but you don't bite into a grape and say, oh, that tastes like rose petals. A lot of these things have to almost be um, kick-started, should we say, and the processes of crushing and fermentation are the two main processes that kick-start these flavours. They essentially live in the grape as a precursor, so they are there, but they just don't taste like very much until something happens to them. Um, and winemakers work incredibly hard to extract or dial up and dial down these certain things, so in, particularly style, in particular styles, we'll go on to in a minute, so much research has been done on thiols. You know, does machine harvesting make this thiol go up more MMDA or whatever it's called, MMDA4? Does this thiol go up? You know, there's so much research into all of this. So this is almost the gold mine of wine aging. And I'm, we're touching the tip of the iceberg in this session. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Chemicals, 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 but they are all naturally occurring. These aren't things that we're adding. These are things that are in the grape as precursors. And then due to the process of winemaking, we experience them as flavor. So let's start at the top. We've got terpenes. Terpenes are probably one of the most fragrant. They are things like flowers, rose petals, citrus. They have funny names like linalool and geraniol, um, which I probably pronounced badly actually, but there we go. Um, they are really stable throughout the whole of the fermentation process. So weird stuff tend not, tends not to happen to them. And that's actually why um, muscat is full of terpenes. Muscat actually tastes quite grapey. And that's because they have this lovely stability through the whole of fermentation. You know, wacky stuff isn't happening. But they also oxidize. And when they oxidize, so linalool, for example, oxidizes to become something called al alpha terpeneal. And that becomes musty and pine-like. And so grapes like muscat that are full of these terpenes and torontes and um, sometimes viognier. Um, these, these high linalool or high terpene, I should say, um, varieties don't tend to age well because essentially they just oxidize and immediately go to this musty, piney thing. Um, aldehydes, you've probably heard that word before. These are formed when grapes are crushed. And in young wines, aldehydes give you this really lovely green grassy note. So Semillon has some aldehydes that we're going to go on to, um, but often a lot of really, really lovely fragrant fresh white wines have that lovely grassiness to them. But they break down during fermentation. And actually at high levels, um, we receive that um, aldehyde, well, acid aldehyde as it becomes. Acid aldehyde, I should say, is actually the aroma found in sherry that makes sherry very attractive. But at high levels, when you are um, not wanting it, it becomes a fault. And so this breakdown of aldehydes produces bruised apples or quite stale wines. So something you once opened and it had a lovely green grassy aroma. I find this sometimes with um, Italian white varieties, you know, once lovely and fresh. And then um, after not very long, suddenly you don't have anything on the nose. And that can be a breakdown in the aldehydes going to the acetaldehydes. So the next one on our list is esters. And there are so many um, esters. In fact, over 160 have been found. 
but there are absolutely masses. And that list, apple, banana, pineapple, that's not actually what they are. Um, if you read the Esther descriptions, there are things like apple-like, banana-like. Um, these are usually formed during fermentation and a winemaker will play with things like temperature of fermentation to, to draw out certain apple-like, banana-like aromas. Um, but as the as wines break down, they will, so there's two things that happen. As they break down, we either lose the fun fruitiness completely, or, and this is quite interesting, sometimes these esters link up together and they can make a wine taste quite soapy. Yeah, that's a strange thing. I don't know whether members are in the chat. Has anybody ever had a soapy wine before? <laughs> not pleasant. Um, but either, they're not two good outcomes, are they? You either lose the fruit or it tastes soapy. Um, and losing the fruit, quite frankly, is why a Beaujolais Nouveau, which is packed full of esters because of the way it's made with special carbonic maceration, Beaujolais Nouveau will not age well because those esters are not designed to age. They're either going to fall off a cliff or, or certain esters go soapy. So good in young wines, not so good in old wines. Uh, thiols. So I spoke earlier about Sauvignon Blanc. It's packed full of thiols and by far the great variety with the most research into the thiols. But um, volatile thiols are in loads of grapes. Semillon, which is our first wine, Riesling, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, just Sauvignon Blanc is so packed full of them. Um, the sad thing about thiols is they just oxidize and they disappear. So that lovely fresh passion fruit that you had in your New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, it just vanishes. So esters and thiols are these things that we crave in young wines and that just don't um, always, again, exceptions to the rule always, um, but they don't always develop into nice things. Um, so quite a challenge. Now ketones is quite fun. Ketones are present in the grape, but I've left the box blank because it's actually quite important that they really don't taste like anything at all. And it's only after the grape is fermented and starting to age that you get any flavor at all. So some, um, like our example here, don't even begin to show uh, when it's aged. And the example here I've put is a ketone, um, when ketones tr transform into lactones. Uh, so Riesling in particular, there's a hydrocarbon that appears and I'm not going to read the full name. I've tried before on an event and I couldn't do it, uh, but it's, its colloquial known name is TDN, and it is exactly as I've written down here. So I will try. Try methyl dihydrin. I can't do it. It's not going to happen. We should taste some wine. <laughs> but it's um, it's that petrol kerosene aroma, and that's really um, one of the ketone changes in Riesling, um, and that's what makes it so special. So. Some people love it, some people hate it, but it is always in aged Rieslings. And what's interesting is um, in Australia, they're saying that, though, that that appears earlier. In Germany, they say it takes longer in that Riesling and it's all down to these chemical actions and these chemical processes. So rather than embarrass myself again and try and say TDN again, which is never gonna happen, <laughs> we can move on to a wine. <coughs> I should say before we move off from flavors though, that, um, sorry, pardon me, my coughs can't come back to haunt me. Um, it's the fear of saying chemical names on camera. Mm. Um, before we move on, um, ah, we've had a good question from John. I'll answer that in a moment. Um, but before we move on, I should also mention that all of those chemical changes that we just spoke about in flavors and aromas can all be slowed down by cool cellaring. This isn't a plug for the wine society. <laughs> But if you don't cellar your wines at a cool temperature, you speed up the process of all of those things happening. I can't remember the exact um, survey, but there is not survey, sorry, piece of research. But there's a piece of research done with the grape variety Sangiovese uh, from Italy. So that goes into Chianti, et cetera. Um, and I believe it was four times as fast if you cellared your wine in a kitchen versus a, a, a chilled cellar. Um, because you're basically just speeding up that aging process and you're speeding up all of those chemical things I just spoke about. So quickly before we move on, it's 20 past, we need some wine. That was the hardest slide, by the way. It's all 
plain sailing from here, plain sailing and delicious wine. Um, but John has asked if soils degrade by oxidation, where does the oxygen come from if we're talking about a sealed environment? A good question, John. There's not really anything, any such thing as a sealed environment in wine, unfortunately. Um, there is actually oxygen in your wine. So there is a tiny little bit of micro oxygenation already in there, um, naturally occurring. There is oxygen in the top of the bottle and you can talk about flushing it with sulfur and you can do all sorts of things. We had Pierre Perrin on last night, who's actually part of a research project de removing oxygen from bottles of wine. But also you have a cork and a cork has an oxygen ingress. In fact, a screw cap has an oxygen ingress as well. It's not completely sealed either, um, but a cork as well has an oxygen ingress and there's all sorts of crazy stuff. I didn't want to go too much into seal seals today. I really want to do a whole session on it. But there's all sorts of different ways of measuring oxygen rates. But basically, one of the main things is that whatever happens, you get this sort of abrupt oxygen um, ingress into any wine really early on in its life, and then it starts to slow down. Um, and it's essentially just the wine craving oxygen, uh, particularly if you have a reductive wine. But we'll, we'll talk about that in length at another focus on, because I really do want to do seals. Seals sound strange. But yeah, basically there is, there is no such thing as a sealed environment. There is always oxygen in your wine at, in some degree. And of course, that's why um, producers of wines built to age go to such lengths to buy expensive corks that are not going to um, speed up that process. So great question, John. Thank you. So let's go on to the wine. Um, like I said, we've got the hardest part over. <laughs> but I find it fascinating. That's all natural. I mean, we say natural, obviously, there's so many reactions, but of course, chemical reactions can be natural, but I just find it fascinating. Um, so Australian wine regions, the reason I've got this up is the wine I'm tasting this evening. And if you've never tried one in your life, then Goodness gracious, you need to you need to get one immediately. Um, but the wine I'm tasting, it took me a long time to like these wines. Um, I'll explain why in a moment, but I'll tell you where it's from, et cetera, et cetera, first. Uh, so this is a wine from the, um, well, it's from the Hunter Valley. So it's actually, this is a rubbish map. Let's move on. This is better. Um, so this is a wine from the Hunter Valley. The Hunter Valley is just here. And what you can't see, annoyingly, because it's cut it off on, for some reason on my PowerPoint here, but this is Sydney just here. So, oh, sorry, it's not, it's not cut off on my map at all. It's just zoomed out. Sydney is just there. Lovely. So we've got the Hunter Valley in green and we've got Sydney just next to it. It's about an hour's drive, I believe, um, although I've never done it. Um, but it is the most extraordinary place. And you may notice, and I'm not meaning this disparagingly, but none of the other areas, hilltops, um, Swan Hill, they're not esteemed for making the finest of wines. They make good wines, but they don't make fine, fine wines. But there is something particularly unusual about the Hunter Valley. And the Hunter Valley has these sort of strange mists and hum it's humid, sticky, foggy, um, not somewhere that you would ever think to grow grapes. And it's also rainy. There's an incredible amount of summer rain. Now, um, this summer rain is arguably one of the reasons that this type of wine was even invented because of this rainfall that they have to pick early before the rain falls. And nowhere else in the world makes Semillon like this. So I'll just quickly explain the style. They pick the grapes at before these rains and they pick them at around 11% alcohol which is quite unheard of you know in the rest of the world but you would also think Australia by Sydney how are they picking grapes at 11% alcohol they're picking them really almost under ripe um luckily the fog does moderate the temperature a bit so you get a little bit slightly longer growing season but we're still picking semi on far far earlier than than places further south in Australia they then ferment this wine at cold temperature in stainless steel, no malolactic fermentation. And they produce effectively what, when young, is a light flavored, green, grassy, I mentioned these all earlier, low color, but high acid, moderate alcohol wine. And, you know, we, we just talked about green and grassy and we talked about how it would go into a sort of more negative um, acetaldehyde state, bruised apples, 
But something magical happened in Hunter Valley Semillon. And I genuinely emailed Wines of Australia to try and get more information because I said, you, I can read all about the transformation and what it tastes like, but I have no stats on the chemical interactions. And effectively, Emma Simington MW emailed back to say, there isn't much research on it. Nobody really knows what's happening here. But after about five or six years, there is a transformation in the bottle. And it's only good quality wines that do this. You can't buy a six pound semi on from the Hunter Valley that's in that green grassy style and expect it to turn into um, this. But it's this sort of Cinderella wine. Um, it's impossible to believe when you smell it that this wine has never seen oak for me because it is so burnt toast, smoky, honey. But I've just told you it's picked at 11%, doesn't taste like very much, stainless steel, no malolactic fermentation. It's it's almost picked like a Pinot Grigio and a cheap one at that. I mean, it's obviously not. The vines are an incredible nick, but it's mind blowing to then get a, a wine that tastes like this. So it is one of the greatest wonders of the wine world. They say leave it for five to six years before this even starts, but you will end up with a wine that can age 30, easily 40 years. It's Hunter Valley Semillon ages longer than most other white wines of the world. It is really extraordinary. So you need to get an old one. I've just spotted somebody who said they had a 2021. Um, yeah, you need to get something old, old um, five to six years, and you need to get something high quality. So if I were buying Hunter Valley Sem, I would say go over 15 pounds. Um, the thing is when they have been aged, like this one has, so this was on the Wine Society website, they are gonna be older than that because somebody has done the aging for you. But uh, I had two wines because I did give a little bit of an, of an alternative suggestion as well. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, the two producers and then I'll tell you a couple of stories about screw caps. Um, but this is by Broken Wood, this wine, 2014. Broken Wood are, um, they've started in the 1970s as a bit of a hobby vineyard for three solicitors from Sydney, because why wouldn't you? It's not far away. And um, they've quickly basically become one of Australia's best sites, now making incredibly fine wine with a syndicate of 23, I think, and a professional winemaker. So a great story, in my opinion. Um, I totally agree with Freddie's tasting note. It's peachy, it's citrus peely. It's definitely getting that beeswax for me. It's packed with beeswax. It smells like my beeswax covers that I put on them. Um, my new, my new eco-friendly beeswax covers. Um, it's incredible. I'm gonna have a quick taste because the other thing about this is that it's also slightly, um, the texture becomes really oily and thick and viscous compared to what it was. So I'm gonna have a quick taste. Mm. I mean, if anybody is tasting an old Hunter Valley Sam, it blows my mind that that has not been an oak barrel. It has this kind of unctuousness, this richness that you usually get from oak. Um, I can't believe that it's an 11% stainless steel wine. It's just amazing. The, the change, the transformation of it is, is something to behold. Um, now, I do know that there's a couple of bottles of this left in the showroom, because um, I do know a member that picked one up. Um, but this is Tyrrell's. Now, Tyrrell's, slightly different uh, history. They were uh, started in 1858 and um, these vineyards at, at Stevens date back as far as 1911. So these are old vines. So they're still producing what feels strangely unconcentrated at the beginning because they literally ferment it and put it in a bottle straight away. They don't age it, they don't do anything. Um, whereas this, uh, but this is old vines, still the same similar winemaking techniques 11%. Um, but here you now get this, gosh, this is really insane intensity. And this is a particularly good single vineyard one. They actually make a wine called Vat One, which is their kind of creme de la creme. And it's probably the most famous Hunter Valley Semillon in the world. It's kind of the benchmark. So um, if you do get a chance to try Tyrrell's um, aged Hunter Valley as well, I, I, please do. Yeah, spice, wax all of the above. So uh, I said I'd talk about closures. I will do that quickly now because um, we're not doing a full thing, but I had to tell you that every Hunter Valley Semillon that is planning on aging 30, 40 years plus is bottled under screw cap. 
And again, I asked Emma Symington why. And she said, uh, <laughs> in the words of Bruce Tyrrell, who I just mentioned, and I'm going to have to read this, so sorry. Uh, Cork Taint on Semillon stands out like a dunny on a hill. So if anyone knows Australian lingo and can translate that for me, but that was that was the quote. Um, but she also told me that back in the 90s, their whole region had a really bad problem with bad quality corks. Completely understandable because, you know, the provenance of getting good quality corks wasn't really realised um, until more recently. And Emma did a tasting. Um, so Emma Symington MW works for Wine of Australia. And she said uh, a few years ago, she did a tasting with that one that I've just told you about, the 1996 vintage. And she only needed four bottles. And um, because they were still using cork in 1996, Bruce sent her over 12 to be sure that getting four would, you know, that she'd get four in good condition. So as soon as they started moving to screw cap after the corks were all a bit of a mess, everybody did too. And the wines, there were already people using kind of different, different closure technologies and the wines are still aging beautifully. So it kind of goes back to that, um, what we were saying earlier about oxygen ingress as well. Right, so that's the hardest bit done. We did the hard colour bit and now we've done the complicated wine, the challenging wine, the wine that breaks all the rules, but is so delicious. Um, so now we're going to talk about red wines. And I think it's probably a bit easier for people to maybe get their head around how red wines age. And then when we hit um, the end of our stride on the red wines, we can go through a few of the um, of the other grape varieties because there are other white grapes. But um, this is the most unusual Hunter Valley semi on aging um is the yeah is the most fascinating of them all so let's talk about color now if you have one or both of the red wines i'm lucky enough to have both of them my colors in fact i'm just going to pop my screen down a second i hate showing color on camera because i don't think you can no rubbish um let's just see if i can show you against a piece of paper no, I um I can promise you now that if I put these two glasses down, there is absolutely no way in heck that I wouldn't be able to tell which one is older without looking at it. I mean, obviously I know which is which, but the 2014 from uh, Santa Steph has still got some of its color in terms of pigmentation, which we'll talk about in a second. So it's still darker and it's definitely more ruby. Now, some grape varieties naturally are redder, but this particular wine has gone rusty brown. It almost looks like a Madeira, and that's our 2006. So if you have got any evidence in the glass, I will tell you what's going on. Um, essentially, colour is derived from something called polyphenols in wine. And especially, there are some polyphenols that, so one's called flavanols, and those are the pigment complexes. And then there's anthocyanins, and they have some beautiful names. Um, Malvadin is the most boring, actually, but that's the most commonly one commonly found in in wines. Uh, the others all have lovely names derived from flowers. So this one's derived from peony, so peonidin. Um, but the juice is very, very, very pink in a um, in a grape. And I will just quickly show you this. This is a normal fermentation. So this isn't some crazy wacky rosé or a Beaujolais. This is a red wine fermentation. This could be easily be a Syrah, making a dark wine. It could easily be a Cabernet Sauvignon. It's actually a Quetzalcoatl, um, but it, it could be, uh, having fermented Syrah in my harvest this year, that could easily be a Syrah ferment. Um, so basically the colour of grapes starts incredibly pink. And as wines age, and even not just the moment they start eating, the moment they start to ferment, that grape derived pigment starts to disappear. And instead they form more stable pigments. It's all about stability when it comes to wine. What is the most stable way that it ends all of these reactions? This, the stability that they form when they're adding onto other compounds within the wine is always redder in color rather than pink. So we have a lessening generally already, and we also have a redder color, and that's just even during fermentation. And there's so many chemical reactions going on that people don't really know at this stage exactly what's happening, but there has been several studies done on the amount of change. And 
during fermentation, by the end of fermentation, 25% of the anthocyanins, anthocyanins, so those color compounds have disappeared. And after one year of aging, 40% have. Now, obviously it slows. Um, we can't keep losing 40% of color. We'd have no color left. Um, but it does, the reaction slows. It's a little bit like oxygen in the corks. There's a big hit at the beginning. And then once the wine sort of stabilizes after one year of aging, um, the reaction time and, and those changes slow. But what you do find is that older wines will be paler and they will be more brick color or garnet. They kind of go purple, well, they go pinky purple, red, and then this kind of like garnet and terracotta brick color, which is where we've got to with that um, Gemma from 2006. So it's quite incredible. There are ways to combat those really early changes. So winemakers can make the wine more stable earlier on. And the main ways that they would do that are, um, I've spelled microoxygenation wrong, um, barrel aging and microoxygenation. So that's adding oxygen um, either through the barrel or through little bubbles. And what that does is it stabilizes the wine and future proofs it. Um, and that is exactly what our second wine has done because that wine has been barrel aged for two years and therefore has stabilized the color. And you often find that Bordeaux have really, really stable color. Those two years in barrel do it a hell of a lot of favors. Um, so we have got a lovely dark color. It's a great wine to taste sort of a bit of age, this wine. It could go longer, but I love that it's a bit of age. So where are we talking about? Let's have a chat about that. So, oh, sorry, there we go. The Santa Steph region is just here. Um, so it's quite northerly, it's quite exposed to the weather up here. Um, it is made as the Madoc left bank wines are with the majority of Cabernet Sauvignon. There is actually a little bit of Cabernet Franc in here, which personally I love, um, but there is also a big lashing of Merlot as well. So Cab Franc majority with then some Merlot, uh, sorry, Cabernet Sauvignon majority with some Merlot and some Cab Franc. Um, it is owned by the same people who own the Cru Classe Colob Labori, um, which is great because it means that we buy a lovely, affordable Santa Steph wine um, made by incredible producers. But they are, um, shall we say, yes, I don't want to call it a second wine because it's actually not. Um, there's actually quite a bit of difference between the two chateaus. So there's a lot more clay in this particular chateau, which means that it has a sort of richer expression, should we say. And I love this in particular because we can talk about all things. Let's not talk about tannins yet, but we can talk about all the things that that make Cabernet so good at aging. So Cabernet has a few of those styles and things we were talking about earlier, but they have generally good reactions. And yes, you can't age these wines forever. So our drink window, I think at the moment is till 2030. What tends to happen to Cabernet after that is it goes what we call quite vegetal. But Cabernet does have a really lovely long window where it can be great. And the typical aging aromas for Cabernet are things like pencil shavings, graphite, cedar, um, tobacco. A lot of people say cigar box because it's kind of cedar wood and tobacco mixed in together, which I think is great. Um, I'm also getting something quite floral. Um, so maybe violets, which is a slightly younger um, ester normally and loads of red currants and red fruits. So they're still hanging on in there, all of that youthful stuff alongside, yeah, alongside of that bit of the development. Um, is anybody tasting along with this wine this evening? Yeah, it's such a great combination. I'm almost getting something kind of herbaceous and youthful in it, because um, it's really fresh herbs and black currants, loads of black currants and cassis. So, it's got such a lovely, it's kind of in its perfect moment where as wines age, you get some of the young stuff, the stuff that we call primary, which are all of those, um, you know, all of the things on the first column that I mentioned. Uh, David said, lovely wine. Good. Thank you, David. <laughs> it's so, I think it's great value, this wine. Um, but in that left-hand column, we had all of those, all of those things in the second-hand column about all of those flavors. You can still get those in old wine. I think I had a comment about it sounding very negative. I'm talking about what those are the that's the eventual journey of flavors. 
the whole thing about aging wine is finding them somewhere in the middle. So here I've still got loads of those black currant leaf, black currant fruit. I've got loads of those primary esters and thiols and all those sorts of things, but I'm also getting some development of them. So that's where aging wine becomes this tightrope walk, this balance between youthful and aged, and you want to catch it at a perfect moment. So oh, I personally love it. Um, I hope you do too. I, oh, I got a real hit of graphite then, real pencil shaving stuff. Right. I'm going to have a taste and then we'll move on because if you're not tasting it along with me, then you might be jealous. Mm. So I said I wanted to save off talking about tannins because I find the tannin in this wine really interesting and actually still really punchy. But we've spoken about the flavour development and the aroma development. The acids, I think they probably... They probably are starting to drop, but it's helping to preserve them. So we're seeing the evidence of what we spoke about on, on that first section. And the colour we've talked about too. So we are going to talk about tannins now. And I think it's worth saying that the tannins in this wine are still incredibly high. I think it's been very extracted. So I'm getting quite a lot of powdery tannin coating the mouth. Um, you could probably find 2014s in the likes of Margot with slightly softer tannins. Um, Santa Steph can be quite um, firm on its tannins, should we say? It's a very structured wine. So I think the tannins for me have got some way to develop here. Even though we don't know the science, um, we, we know that tannins soften. And for me, I'd personally like to give this, although I loved the aromas and the flavors, I'd like to give this a little more time or you eat it with some salty food and that will soften the tannins as well because of the interaction with um, the proteins uh, and the salt, well, proteins in particular. So what on earth is going on with tannins? I've already said we're not really sure, but let's at least talk about why we need tannins in aging wine, because we sort of do and we sort of don't. Um, but let's just say what we, what we know and what we thought we knew. So um, tannins are really difficult to understand because they actually keep connecting up and breaking apart. They are not stable. Um, so nobody really ever knows what they're doing because for a long time we thought, in fact, wait, I'll tell you the myth afterwards. Um, but tannins, tannins do have a significant role in aging potentials of red wine. Now I've written here oxygen, oxygen sink. And what I mean by that is um, they have quite complex combinations with anthocyanins and they are antioxidant. So they act in some ways like the acidity. The acidity is preserving, um, look, making sure that that low pH is keeping the naughty microbes away, et cetera, et cetera. Tannins can also act as a preservative for wine. You don't need tannins to age. Just think of Pinot Noir, you know, some lovely um, Pinot Noir wines don't need really, really high tannins and white wines don't have tannins. So they can't, um, you know, they can't say, yes, we're being helped along. This Hunter Valley Semillon is just as old as the Santa Steph. They taste completely different. And the Hunter Valley Semillon has not had any help from tannins. Um, but what happens then? In which case, why do tannins get softer? This is so mind boggling. And the answer is that nobody knows. And the answer of, of, we, of what we thought used to be the case is that we used to think um, that the tannin chains, so the, the little, uh, I should have put a photo of tannin, not that they're particularly exciting, but they we used to think the chains of tannins all joined together, which is what you can actually feel in your mouth. So they're the, um, the oh, I've got, even got the name of them up here. They're the flavanols or the capuchins. Um, and we used to think that they formed these really, really long chains and then eventually dropped out. And when we thought they dropped out, we thought that was the sediment in the bottom of the bottle. And that's why the tannins are softer because these big chains have fallen to the bottom. So therefore the actual amount of tannin is less. And that has basically been disproved. So we now know that longer tannins taste more astringent. So actually, if that were, if, if our old thinking were true, it would mean that at the point where wines were at the beautiful moment where they were supposed to be tasting really soft and 
just before they dropped out, we would effectively be tasting a tannin party. Um, that's not the case. Tannin, small tannins actually taste better. So the smaller strings of tannins are smoother for us. So something is happening. Are the tannins breaking apart or are they degrading? Nobody's quite sure, but the only thing that we do know that, that has been proven is the shorter the chain of tannin, the softer they taste. But there is no evidence to say that that is happening during wine aging. In fact, there is, um, I think, oh, who was it? Caroline Gill BMW has, has quoted a 50 year old um, Australian wine that she said had the highest recorded tannin levels and chains at 50 years old. So the scientists are effectively still on the hunt for the answer to that one, which I know is deeply frustrating. Um, but one thing that you can assume is that the older a wine is, the softer and the kind of more, more plush, more molded the tannins are. So it leads me beautifully onto our final wine, which is a wine that has such naturally high tannins that you can't really drink it before 10 years, um, which is, is quite amazing, actually. It is from the Nebbiolo grape, so it's the same, um, <clears throat> pardon me, it's the same grape variety as Barolo, and it's also from the Piemonte region, but it is not from the Alba area, which is here, which is where we find our famous Barolo. It is actually from this region here. So it's actually very far north, um, right by Lombardy. And the region is called Geme, and they have a reputation for needing even longer than Barolo to soften up. And so, um, Barolo is a notorious wine for needing a bit of age. It's often called the kind of rustic cousin of Barolo, which I think is a little unfair. Um, you'll see from this wine, there's nothing rustic about it. It's actually 90% Nebbiolo, but we won't hold it to, against it. Um, but this is now 15 years old. So this is a wine that has seriously aged. Um, they, the way they make this wine is by fermenting it in very cool stainless steel tanks. So they want to preserve some of those fresh esters. And Nebbiolo is famous for those kind of floral and tart fruits. And I do get the violets. Um, that Sarah describes on here. I get the tart cherry, I get the cranberry. It's almost Christmassy um, in its cranberry smells. But it's, so they ferment it cool, control stainless steel, and then they mature the wine in 2,500 litre um, barrels. So, you know, they've given it some softening up, but they've basically said this needs to sit in a bottle for 15 years before anybody touches it because those Nebbiolo naturally has incredibly high acid and incredibly high tannins. So let's have a quick taste. Mm. Oh, wow. It's got this amazing, almost like Coca-Cola bitterness. Sorry, that sounded strange. Coca-Cola is very sweet. It's got this Coca-Cola finish, but it's got this like peppery, um, I guess Coca-Cola you could say is slightly herbaceous and, and it's got that going on. Um, the tannins are completely different to the wine before. So they're really still there and they are slightly chalky, but they're more silky than the wine before. And the acidity is less present. I can see that the acidity has dropped out in this wine. So all of the things that I was expecting or were expecting are certainly ringing true. In terms of the flavours that come, I'm just going to take that down, in terms of the flavour changes, what's really interesting is young Nebbiolo is quite a, a tough wine to drink. So you don't really drink much young Nebbiolo anyway, but I wouldn't have put this at 15 years old for anything other than the colour and probably the acid, which is, is that bit lower. Um, but in terms of the flavours, it's still very fruity. Um, it's still got this incredible kind of vibrancy and, and peppy fruits to it, which, yeah, it's got the age, but it's, it's, um, it's got this kind of tobacco leaf thing as well. Oh, it really is. I mean, that's a very, very complex wine. Um, and obviously the price, the price tells you it's going to be complex, um, but it's quite astonishing. 
Um, if you haven't ever tried a wine like that, it's worth trying, whether it's an old Barolo, um, they tend to be gen across the board higher quality, um, or whether it's a wine like that, which is, is a special version of a Gamay wine, then I would highly recommend it because, oh, there's a reason why they say it's the kind of king of wine, wine of kings Barolo. It's got this ethereal quality that's very, very hard to explain. It's, it is Coca-Cola and menthol and tobacco and almost medicinal but in a beautiful way but then packed with bitter cherries um very very Christmassy in the cranberry so yeah gorgeous wine um so there we go another age-worthy wine so I said at the end I was going to quickly run through some wines and sort of how they age why they don't age etc and I'm just going to go through a few classics if that's all right because I think we haven't got too much time um, and I'll quickly whiz through some of those and then hopefully we can do a few questions. Um, but I'm going to start with the whites because the whites were underserved by only having one and having a curious one. Hunter Valley Semillon, obviously an oddity. On paper, a watery white, low alcohol, pretty sort of meh white wine should not do that. So that's our weird and wonderful um, freak wine that we adore um, but there are some wines that make more sense so two of the best wines for aging are Riesling and Chenin Blanc or I should say grapes now in their dry styles so without sweetness Riesling and Chenin Blanc um, have really high acidity they both do slightly different things so all Riesling can doesn't always but it can get that petrol aroma but it can also just go this beautiful honey beeswax almost candied fruits and that can happen with dry and sweet Riesling, arguably the longest aging, ageable white wine in the world. And then Chenin Blanc is equally high in acid. And we go back to that whole anti, um, you know, antimicrobial, slightly preservative thing. I don't think yeah, it's hard to say whether the pH, it depends where you grow it to say whether the pH and acid is higher in Riesling or Chenin. But naturally, Chenin affords itself lots and lots of natural acids as well. Again, you get sweet and dry versions. I would say, especially from the Loire, that's where you're going to be looking at quality for Chenin. Um, I have had some amazing old Vouvray's from the 60s that are just incredible. They have almost started to go into that bruised apple stage, but in a pleasant way. So we've not gone and pushed into the faulty end. Um, but also I've had, I had a 1990 um, Vouvray uh, demi-sec uh, last year, and it was absolutely fabulous. It was still sort of, singing of apple and pastry and um yeah it, it almost tasted sweeter somehow for being older so Riesling and Chenin Blanc are kind of your bankers for for ageability they tend to do better than some of the other grapes Chardonnay is actually not that great at aging it's okay white burgundy is shorter lived than you would think certainly shorter lived white burgundy is shorter lived than the great Rieslings of Germany or Chenins of the Loire it's okay Obviously, most of you will know that it's got a, it had a problem white burgundy with premature uh, pre premature oxidation, uh, premox, and it's um, essentially all of those things that I said could happen happened. So we had acetaldehyde uh, forming to get that stale and and um, uh, sherry esque note, but not in a good way, in a bad way, bruised apple, um, and then we lost a lot of the fruit flavors as well. Good white burgundy can age, but I would say err on the side of caution. Not all white burgundies are built to age, so you need to be really careful and pick a top producer. Uh, white Bordeaux, so that is made from Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc doesn't traditionally age very well, but White Bordeaux, when mixed with Semillon, there is something. Uh, they're both high acid. They can have some length. Again, they're not wines I would keep for too long. And the ones that tend to age, tend to age better are the ones that have been aged in oak barrel or even fermented. Semillon doesn't love fermenting in oak barrel, but they might have aged the Sauvignon and uh, fermented, sorry, the Sauvignon and oak. That provides a little bit of extra length. And then strangely, Viognier from the Northern Rhone, everyone, I um, don't mean to be disparaging, everyone always tells me it's lovely with a little bit of bottle age. Um, you don't want to age it more than 10 years, really, in my opinion. Um, so yeah air on the side of caution is that as that um it does do interesting things when you do leave it to age but it will not go forever um i'll do sweet wines afterwards because i'll move on to dry reds quickly um 
we've already moving backwards from what we did we already discussed nebbiolo that it really is one of the best grapes for aging because it actually just needs it young nebbiolo is an assault on the senses so nebbiolo needs it um another italian grape that is good not quite as good is sangiovese but sangiovese can see some age and it does some quite interesting herbaceous things so in the likes of your chianti um, there are a few other Sicilian grapes or grapes from the south um, as well that can age. And that comes down to high acid, high alcohol, high tannins and all of those things. Cabernet Sauvignon tends to age better than Merlot. Not always in, in Bordeaux, but tends to, again, naturally higher acids, naturally higher tannins. And I've talked about the sorts of flavours that you can get from lovely old Cabernet Sauvignon. And then I probably want to mention, uh, before we have five minutes for questions, uh, Pinot Noir. I mentioned it earlier. It's a grape that technically on paper, it's not necessarily got the structure that you'd want to age, and it doesn't age as long as the likes of something like Nebbiolo. However, it does do really exciting things, and there are flavours I get from aged Pinot Noir, whether it's Burgundy or New World or wherever it's from. There are flavours I get from Pinot Noir that I go, oh, I like that. Um, it does things very differently to some of its counterparts. I often get a kind of streaky bacon, sweet, sweaty meat, sad, sweaty saddles always in there. It can go a bit horsey. Um, so it does some unusual things when it ages. So if you are lucky enough to try some old Pinot Noir, please do. But it will not and should not age as long as the likes of, of your Nebbiolos and, and often your Cabernets as well. It doesn't have enough um, antioxidant preservatives, quite frankly. So I've done a run through. I can obviously ask, um, I can obviously answer any other questions you might have. Um, oh, Peter Cousins says, as usual, I think the Gemme is stunning. Good. I'm glad. Um, somebody is drinking the same wine. Ah, OK. So someone is drinking the Santa Steph in 2005 and it still feels fairly youth from 2005. Sorry. <laughs> and it feels fairly youthful. Um, I'm sure of it. I still think I think we did a, a great job to show that this wine is ready to drink now, but could could age further as well. Um, and then I can also see that somebody is watching with a glass of 1996 Vouvray. So, yes, Keith, you are quite right. I would absolutely love that. <laughs> um, right. So I've got a couple of questions. I've got one question that I think is fascinating and is blowing my um master of wine studying brain out of the water, because, Peter, this could be a master of wine question. Um, I could easily tell over the paper and see this. Are age-worthy wines created in the vineyard or in the winery? What a question. I think fundamentally, if your grapes, this is going to be such an abridged version, but I could sit down and I want to write the essay. Um, if you have bad quality grapes, you will not be able to make an age-worthy wine. That is just a fact. The reason that these Hunter Valley Semillons are so special is because the grape quality is good. Even though they're picking it early, all of those precursors are still knocking around in there. You have to have top quality grapes in order to even give it the potential to make futures wine, wine that you can drink in the future. Um, if you don't have that, then there's no point in trying. But what I would say is there are certain things that you can do in the winery that would encourage that sort of, um, you can encourage wines to be longer lived. So things like putting your wine in oak, that does tend to do that micro oxygenation job that tends to give it a bit of a helping hand or things like loads and loads of extraction to make sure that you do have um, enough color, putting it in the oxygen to then stabilize the color um because all of those anthocyanins and things are all wrapped up together so it's worth saying that tannins and color and all those bits and pieces and red wines in particular are all they're all very much um in it together so when you're extracting uh, all of that color you're also extracting lots of tannins so great question peter and i think it's a combination of both but i do think you probably can create wines in a winery that are more age worthy with Sorry, I think you can't create wines in a winery that are age worthy if your fruit quality is bad. So it has to be in the vineyard before the winery if you maybe land on on one side or the other. Um, and then last but not least, um, this was something I flagged earlier, but I think it's worth addressing. The slide on flavours, um, it was said it looked like I was trying to make them all negative. It's it's not meant to be negative. It was meant to be um this is the chemical process that eventually ends up happening. 
And as I mentioned, it's finding the sweet spot in the middle. It's the beauty where you get um, apple pastry before the bruised apple comes in. Um, so it is finding that sweet spot and making sure um, and making sure that you aren't waiting until that final part of the slide. And it's worth, as a final sign off, um, saying that so many wines in the world are not built to age. And we've got three spectacular wines this evening, but they weren't cheap. And do not, I suppose my, my flavours and aromas slide was to encourage you not to just hang on to wines in the hope that um, they will get better because not every wine is built like that. And I hope at the Wine Society, we do try and encourage you with our drink dates as to when to drink wines. And that's not just finger in the wind. That is years and years and years of experience and tasting and tasting back vintages and people like Sebastian Payne going on the Bordeaux buying trips, even when he's retired so that he can say, yes, I, I remember tasting a wine like this, the 72 vintage, and it did this and it did this and it did this. Um, there are people far brainier than me that predict the drink dates of wines at the Wine Society. So do listen to them. I know they're conservative. We all know they're conservative. So you can be a little bit flexible with them, but they are there for a reason. Um, and sadly, you know, your New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is not going to live for 10 years unless it's a particularly exceptional one. Um, so it's just worth making that point. So thank you all. Um, tomorrow in the follow up email, I didn't want to send it in advance because it felt a bit strange, but I'm going to send vintage dates. We also have those. So just for the key regions, so it's sort of Rome, Bordeaux, etc. we have vintage dates. So I'm going to send those around for everyone. Um, and then I'm also going to send around the slides for anyone who wants them. So I'll send a link to the vintage dates in the follow-up email. But if you do want to have the slides, just let us know and we will send them over to you. I think we've already had one request from Paul. Um, all those lovely chemicals. Yeah, we got geeky tonight. <laughs> um, well, have a lovely evening, rest of the evening, everyone. I am really excited i'm going to go pop this semi on back in the fridge and i'm going to catch the last of the sun and enjoy it because it really has become one of my favorite wines in the absolute world having thought that all semi on from hunter valley tasted like water for almost all of my wine career until about four years ago um when i just well maybe even three years ago when my boss who is an aussie told me that you don't drink it that young you wait and now i understand <laughs> so thank you tim uh for yeah for opening my eyes to aged Hunter Valley Semillon. It's genuinely changed my wine life. So thank you all so much for joining. Hope you have a lovely rest of the evening, lovely rest of the week, and I will see some of you next week, I'm sure.